Hello, and welcome to part three of our lecture series on the female reproductive system. And in part three, we're going to take a look at what's occurring within the oviducts, and most importantly, what's occurring uh, within the uterine wall. Now, to start with, the oviducts, or the uterine tubes, or the fallopian tubes, are going to be structures that are going to extend out from the uterus uh, to essentially come very close to the ovary, because they're going to capture that released ovum and transport it whether it becomes fertilized or not, uh, from its release site at the point where the ovaries are, are there, uh, and transport it into uh, the uterus. Now, it's going to take a little bit of time for uh, the egg cell, that released ovum, to be transported uh, throughout the uterine tubes. And so the uterine tubes, the oviducts, the fallopian tubes, are often going to be the primary site uh, for fertilization to occur. And so if we take a look at this uh, diagram, we can see the ovary kind of in this kind of central position. It's actually two on one on each side. Uh, normally only one ovary is going to be releasing an egg uh, during each ovarian cycle. Uh, that egg is going to be released, picked up by the fimbria, uh, kind of funneled down through the infundibulum, and ultimately transported through the uterine tube proper uh, into uh, the uterus over here. Now if we take a look at the uterine tubes, uh, again, what we're going to see is that the beginning of it is going to be spread out relatively like a funnel. And so it's basically going to be surrounding, coming very close to uh, the ovary. And so it minimizes the, the chance that we're going to lose the ova as it's being released. And so if we take a look at the infundibulum, kind of the beginning portion of the oviducts, uh, we're going to see it's kind of funnel shaped uh, as that distal segment, the segment that's kind of distal from the uterus, but it's going to be closest to the ovary. And we're going to see a lot of fimbria. We're going to see like finger-like mucosal folds, which are going to project towards and almost try to wrap themselves around the ovary. Now, they don't completely surround the ovary, but they're going to almost like a catcher's mitt, kind of wrap towards it and kind of increase the likelihood that the egg being released is going to be picked up by the oviducts and, and transported through them. So the infundibulum is going to have lots of branches, uh, lots of uh, kind of spaces that are going to be present there. The ampulla is going to be a wide middle segment of the oviducts. Uh, again, lots of branch mucosa folds, and this is primarily going to be our location for fertilization uh, to be occurring. As we get closer and closer to the uterus itself, the uterine tubes are going to be kind of condensed down, and those mucosa folds are going to become less elaborate, and basically you're going to be funneling the, ov uh, the ova, the egg, into a smaller and smaller structure that will ultimately deliver it into uh, the uterus. So the isthmus is going to be a narrow segment adjacent to the uterine wall. It's going to have relatively few folds. And when we take a look at what we've got over here on uh, the, the image to the right, we're going to have the pars interstitialis, the intramural portion, where we basically have relatively few mucosal folds. And we've got the myometrium, uh, essentially a portion of the uh, smooth muscle of the wall of the uterus, which is going to be surrounding and, in essence, forming the wall structure of the oviducts. If we take a look at the cells that are going to be lining the uterine tubes, uh, we're going to see ciliated columnar cells. And again, so we see a simple columnar epithelium, cilia along the surface, and we've seen cilia before. They're capable of feeding. Uh, they've got microtubule cores, uh, the little pricking motors that are involved with them. They're going to allow the, the cilia to beat back and forth, and that's going to allow them to propel the egg uh, from where it's picked up uh, by the ovary towards the uterus. We're also going to see smaller cells, smaller non-ciliated cells, are going to be referred to as PEG cells. And these are going to be involved with secreting a mucus. Again, that mucus is going to be important because if we trace all the way down through the uh, uterine tubes, through the uterus, through the vagina, we're going to see that it's exposed to the outside world. And so these PEG cells are going to be producing a film which is going to help protect against bacterial access to the peritoneal cavity. We want to minimize the risk of disease-causing agents from coming up, kind of going the opposite direction as the egg, and getting into the peritoneal cavity and causing an infection to occur. Now, if we look at the uterus, what we're going to see is a, a hollow muscular organ, which is going to be specialized because it's going to be involved with essentially housing and supporting the development of that fertilized egg, which is going to become the embryo, and then it's going to develop into the fetus, which is going to undergo a very rapid uh, growth and development. But it needs to be surrounded, it needs to be supported, it needs to be housed, it needs to be fed, uh, protected, uh, and then ultimately uh, it needs to be expelled from the uterus uh, in the process of childbirth. 
And so we take a look at the uterus, we're going to see an organ that's going to be capable of doing all of these things based on changes that are going to be occurring within its structure. Now, the uterine lining is going to be the endometrium, and it's going to be the endometrium that undergoes the most dramatic changes with the uh, ovarian cycles, uh, what would be the uterine cycle now, because we're, we're talking about within the uterus. Uh, the ovarian, I'm sorry, the uterine lining, the endometrium, is going to be lined by a simple columnar epithelium, and we're going to find simple tubular glands, so we'll say almost like test tube-like glands, at least at the starting point, which are going to extend down into the endometrium um, and essentially be an extension of these simple columnar cells. And the endometrium is going to be important because this is the region that's going to be involved with receiving uh, the uh, fertilized egg, receiving uh, the embryo. So it allows for implantation. It's going to be able to support the nourishment and development of that uh, fertilized egg as it goes through the embryonic and then fetal stages of development. The myometrium is going to be the middle layer. It's going to be the thickest layer. It's going to be composed of smooth muscle cells. And it doesn't change a lot during the uterine cycles, but during pregnancy, it's going to undergo both hyperplasia and hypertrophy. Hyperplasia is an increase in the number of cells, so you're going to have many, many more of these smooth muscle cells. And hypertrophy, these cells are going to become larger. And so we actually get uh, an enlargement and thickening of the uterine wall uh, during pregnancy. And this is, again, to allow for uh, childbirth to occur, to expel the, the, the infant then uh, from the, the region within the uterus uh, during a childbirth. Uh, later on, when childbirth occurs, the pituitary hormone oxytocin, which we talked about previously, causes the myometrial contractions and causes a synchronization of those contractions. So all of the smooth muscle cells are, are very forcefully um, contracting in unison so that you get the very strong uh, contractions involved with childbirth. Now, if we take a look at what's going on within the endometrium again, because this is what's going through the majority of changes within the uterine cycles, kind of running parallel to the ovarian cycles, we're going to have two layers within the endometrium. We're going to have the stratum functionalis, which is in some books described as a pars functionalis, which is a temporary layer. It's going to be the layer closest to uh, the space within the uterus, and it's going to be the stratum functionalis, which is going to thicken uh, and ultimately be shed in response to the ovarian uh, hormones. The stratum bacillae in two on our diagram uh, to the right uh, is going to be a thinner, deeper, but permanent layer uh, within the endometrial lining. So it's going to be this region which is maintained during menstruation and it's going to contain the basal portions of those endometrial glands, uh, the simple tubular glands that we talked about previously, and it's going to be these cells that regenerate and form a new stratum functionalis in the next uterine phase. Now during the proliferative phase of the uterus, roughly days 4 to 16 to 14, we're going to be corresponding to the ovarian follicular phase. So essentially in response to FSH, taking a look at what's occurring within the ovaries, we've got the ovarian follicles growing and they're going to produce estrogen. That estrogen is going to get into the body, it's going to circulate, but it's going to get to the uterus and the estrogen is going to cause those cells uh, to essentially, within the stratum functionalis, to regenerate. So it's going to cause the stratum functionalis to thicken. We're going to have glands that are going to be present, and the glands are going to lengthen, and they're going to remain relatively straight. Now, following ovulation, we're going to have the luteal phase of the ovary. And so what we're going to have is basically days 14 to 18 of the uterine cycle, uh, but take a look at this in response to what's going on within the ovary. And so we're no longer only under the control of the estrogen that's being produced. Uh, the corpus luteum, that temporary endocrine structure produced by the remnants of that ovarian follicle, are going to be producing both estrogen, but most importantly, progesterone at this point. That progesterone is going to cause the cells within the stratum functionalis to continue to divide, so the glands are going to continue to grow, but the endothelial lining doesn't really thicken much more. So if we got more cells within the glands, the glands are becoming longer, but the epithelium, uh, essentially the mucosa, the endometrium, doesn't get any higher, we've got to essentially twist those glands around. So instead of straight glands, we're going to start to see highly coiled glands. And these glands, again, under the control of progesterone, are going to secrete a number of glycoproteins. During the secretory phase, they're going to secrete these glycoproteins which is going to fill and dilate the lumens. And so some books are going to talk about them as having kind of a sawtooth appearance. 
because you've got this kind of jigzag, uh, kind of highly coiled appearance. You've got uh, dilation of the lumens as that secretory product starts to accumulate within there. And it's basically priming that endometrial wall. And so that by day 20, that endometrium is ready to receive uh, that fertilized egg, to be able to receive uh, the embryo. Now, as we talked about it, if implantation doesn't occur, uh, if pregnancy doesn't occur, if we don't have that HCG uh, being produced, the corpus luteum is going to break down. And if the corpus luteum breaks down, it's no longer going to be producing estrogen and progesterone. And so what's going to happen is decreases in progesterone level are going to cause a spastic constriction of coiled arteries that go into the stratum functionalis. And so essentially we're going to constrict the arteries, we're going to limit the blood flow uh, into the stratum functionalis, and by limiting the blood flow into the stratum functionalis, we're basically going to cause ischemia. We're going to cause cell death because we're going to be starving these cells of oxygen and nutrients. And so as these cells die, we're going to have cell death, we're going to have degeneration of the stratum functionalis. And so that's going to result in kind of a disruptive uh, structure to the in uterine lining, disruptive uh, kind of breakdown of the endometrium. Uh, but we're going to see the stratum functionalis being shed, but the stratum bacilli and the uh, myometrium, uh, stratum bacilli one on this diagram and the myometrium, the smooth muscle cells on two of this diagram, are essentially innervated, I'm not innervated, uh, they receive blood supply from uh, relatively straight arteries, uh, so they're not the same arteries that constrict under the, you know, the loss of progesterone. So their blood flow remains the same, they remain uh, in essence alive, and so they're there to replace the cells under the next cycle. When we get to the next proliferative phase of the uterus, those cells in the basal portion of the stratum basale are going to grow out and regenerate a new stratum functionalis. Now if we look kind of beyond that, uh, the cervix is a uterine extension that bulges into the va uh, vaginal, cavity, uh, vaginal canal. Uh, it's going to be involved with producing a variety of types of mucus. Uh, but again, this mucus is going to be important because it's going to regulate the passage of materials through that, again, as a protective mechanism, because we have, in essence, a, an open pathway to the external world uh, but it goes from uh, the vagina through the uterus to the oviducts into the peritoneal cavity. And so we want to try to minimize the risk of bacteria or pathogenic materials from getting in here. And so it's going to produce a mucus. Now at ovulation, it's going to be producing what's referred to as a type E mucus. This is going to be a hydrated mucus, uh, which means that things can pass through it. And so in essence, when the egg is being released, we're going to have a type of mucus that's going to allow sperm sperm cells, uh, to, uh, hopefully for fertilization, to pass through uh, the mucus plug, which is going to be present uh, at the, the opening to the cervix. At other stages within the ovarian cycle, we're going to have type G mucus, which is less hydrated, it's more tightly packed, so that it in essence forms a, a barrier to materials such as sperm or other you know, bacteria or other disease-causing materials to block their passage into um, the uterus and potentially into the peritoneal cavity. This is going to finish up our discussion associated with uh, the actual structures of the female reproductive tract. In part four, uh, we're going to come back and talk about the accessory glands, uh, talk about the mammary glands. Uh, as always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu.